came back to Perth and then got a phone call uh, from uh, Guido, actually, at the time, saying that Sri Mataji want, had bought a house in, in England, Shruti Camps, and obviously wanted to do, you know, fix it up and make it a place of, for Sajoga. So uh, I, w I went to Shruti Camps and they had the first Bhumi Devi Puja there. And at that point, there was, you know, it was basically people from all over the world had arrived um, to... Um, I was under the impression to, to do work at Shruti Camps, uh, which was really good. Um, and then, of course, and that, that was the first... We had a few meetings with Sri Mataji, let's say the, the so-called builders, had a meeting with her and it was at that point that um, you know there was all sorts of discussions about facades and, and fixing up all, the, all these different areas and I remember thinking wow luckily there's so many people here because it sounds like it's a huge project and uh, and so that, that, uh, that weekend ended you know the the weekend and the puja was over and all of a sudden everybody disappeared except a very very small group of us and i remember that there was an italian fellow who was actually a union rep uh, with very little building experience uh, and an indian fellow that had a university degree and i can't even remember what but definitely wasn't in in the building sector and uh, so we were stuck at duty camps, no tools, no money, and uh, all this work to do. And with the get the message that Sri Mataji wanted to come up the following weekend to stay, and we had to get all this work done. And I suppose the interesting part about throughout my involvement in, in the various projects and Shooty Camp was the first one. The second one was, um, I'd say the second one was Gijiganam. And then there was uh, Kabbalah. And then F Kabbalah one and two, because we, we built the hangar in Kabbalah and then moved it. And the final one that I worked on was uh, at Kanajahari, uh, which was the, uh, Again, very similar. And all of these projects throughout the time, there, there was definitely, after doing four of them, there was definitely a common denominator. And that was, there was a whole pile of people with a lot of enthusiasm and not much experience. And, and it, it made it an extreme pleasure to work on these projects in contrast to the building that I used to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And really the building was really, had nothing to do with it. It was never about the building, interestingly enough. Although, in, as, as it started, when, when uh, even when I, did you get up for instance, was Sri Mataji had come to Perth and uh, we had uh, just finished or in the process of building a bit of an ashram or renovating an old house where uh, you know, a number of us were living and uh, I remember Sri Mataji saying well you know this is very nice but you should uh, you should go out and look for a bigger place and do it up and I think it was the last thing that anybody wanted to hear in, in the collective that we had to re-renovate re, re another old place and it just happened that uh, you know that she was on the Australian tour went around Australia and, and I was lucky enough to go with her to New Zealand and it was on our way back to from New Zealand uh, sitting in an aeroplane with her 
she asked me, she says, oh, you, you build these hangers. And I said, yes, Ramanaji, and these hangers that we had a, we actually had a patent on were for aeroplanes. And she says to me, oh, do you think, oh, would they make a good ashram? And, you know, like, I was a bit taken back. I never really thought about it as an ashram. And she said to me, yeah, I think I think they make good ashrams. You, you should build four of them in Perth at Gijigana in the shape of a swastika and then build a little cottage for me so I can come when I come. So, you know, they, we came back to Australia and it was at that time that Gijigana was owned by Joe and Robin and they were kindly enough, kind enough to annex a piece of their land up there and we built one of the four um, and uh, it was you know like I said it was uh, built by totally unskilled labour and a reasonably complex well when I say at least structurally complex building um, we even had to uh, use dynamite so that we could blow the rock up to get the foundations in for, for Gitchigana. Uh, but throughout the time, it was um, a rather, uh, it was a, an experience that it was never about the building. We, we spent virtually weekends going up there, a group of us, uh, and basically having a good time. And by the way, we ended up with a, with a building. Uh, similarly, um, I got a phone call when I was in the Middle East working, um, and she says, oh, we need a hangar, one of your hangars in Cabela. And um, so obviously I was in the Middle East. Um, She wanted us to me to organise the, the thing, so I got the the, uh, the hangar built in Australia. It was built, it was fabricated here in Perth, placed in a container, and shipped to Italy. And then I flew to Italy to organise the erection of it. And again, when I got to Italy, nobody knew about. They knew that there was this hangar coming, but really there was no uh, sort of interest lol. And all of a sudden I had to, luckily found a fellow Rosario that was willing to give me a hand. And we had to go to the, the port and get this container taken off a ship pay all the so-called duties and work out what we had to do and granted I can speak Italian but you know it was reasonably difficult to get anyway finally we we were able to get this container taken up to Gabella and even that was a feat uh, a rather incredible feat because the truck that took it up to where we placed it. The roads were so narrow that part of the truck was hanging over the cliff as he was going around the corner. So some of the wheels weren't even touching the ground. And literally, it was, I'm not really sure how it got up there, but it, it, did, it did end up, he did end up putting it there. And we unloaded this container. And then the fun started. And with all of these projects, there's a normal, there was always an enormous amount of play happening in the background where you would find... Um, so we got to Cabela, and of course, there was no permissions to build this hangar, but the puja was in four weeks' time, and Sri Mataji was going to have the puja in the hangar. So we had four weeks. So the first week was visiting the council and trying to get a permission, which we finally got a temporary permit to build it. Um, and then in the middle of the site where we were going to build it, 
there was a telecommunications pole, which was the main line coming up into it and then branching out to four villages further north. So myself and Rosario endeavoured to try and get this pole removed. And of course the bureaucracy in Italy just didn't allow it to occur in four weeks. And so the time was getting shorter and we couldn't get the pole moved. Uh, every time we rang up, they'd say yes, 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 but nothing had happened. And it was fascinating, I was talking to the, this excavator driver who had nothing to do with Sarjoga, but was an excavator in the town and knew about Shumadji and, and uh, us building this hangar. This. And uh, interesting enough, he says to me, Frank, you know what? I can see you having problems. Why don't you just go down the village and have a coffee? And whatever happens, don't come back for three or four hours. And uh, he says, uh, he says, don't worry about it, I'll fix it. And I'm thinking, Are you sure? Yeah, 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 you just go down, have a coffee, don't worry about it. And of course, by the time I got down to the village, there was, not even 10 minutes later, there was these sirens coming up the valley, which were these telecom vans, and of course, <laughs> gone up to, um, to the hangar. And this fellow had just knocked the pole down, and of course, you know, cut the telephone communications to four towns, and all of a sudden it was, the pole was moved, you know. So it, within the four, anyway, the, the obstacles kept, appearing. We, uh, we had the steel structure made and shipped from Perth, but we had to buy screws. Uh, and I thought oh, I'd be easier to buy them in Italy, you know, I mean, it's not, it's not a, you know, a complicated uh, item. I'm sure they've got millions of them. Well, just to buy screws in Italy well, turned out to be an absolute nightmare. Now, you, we, even to the point where I nearly, I had to ring Belgium to try and get screws uh, for this, for this hangar. So, and then finally, this Italian company decided to sell me screws, you know, at, right at the last, last death knock. So, we were two weeks out, still no hangar built, you know, and we had just poured the concrete. Uh, <clears throat> and... Uh, on a regular basis, I'd get asked, oh, she might just want to know, will, will the hangar be ready for, for the puja? I said, well, yeah, fine. Yeah, yes, it should be ready. And till obviously week out from uh, the puja date and the Austrians arrived. And of course they were in, they needed to set up the stage for the puja and so on and so forth. And we still really didn't have the hangar up. We had it on the ground, but not up. And, and so, I mean, I think they were totally horrified that we're at the state we were. And uh, so I'd get, yeah, uh, Shumadji wants to have the hangar, uh, the puja at, at the hangar, but will you be ready? And I said, well, if Shumadji wants to have the puja at the hangar, we'll be ready. And the Austrians were, you know, they were nervous to the point where they decided to set up the tent, the pendle, on uh, the other side of the river in Cabela, in case, because they never, they never ever thought that the hangar would be ready. And so they, they put up this pendle, built the stage, and of course by this time we lifted the hangar and it was in place. And probably only one or two days out from the from Saturday or Sunday to Puja Day. Um, they had gone to see Mother and said, Lord, the hangar's not going to be ready. So obviously, Sunday Pasanja came, probably Sunday came to see me and says, oh, you know, Shumaji wants to have the Puja in the hangar. I says, well, she wants to have the Puja in the hangar, it will, you know, it will be ready. What can I say, you know, <laughs> we'll get it ready. Anyway, so she then instructed the Austrians to pull down the stage or, and then they had to 
rebuild it inside the hangar. And so, <laughs> so I mean, obviously, logically they weren't impressed, but also there was a hell of a lot of work to do. But anyway, finally it all got, it all happened. The stage was in place, the hangar was eh, finished uh, well enough for the uh, program, Saturday night program to go ahead, bar one little thing. There was a, between the hangar and the road where Sri Mataji was going to arrive, there was like a, a rather large dip, actually, and probably about two metres deep. So it was very difficult to get Sri Mataji onto the stage. So we had to build a bridge and literally in, in two or three hours a bridge was built which was about three metres, three, four metres long and I remember there was about three of us banging away and nailing handrails up and so on and Sri Mataji's car arrived she, and she gets out of the car and I'm still holding a hammer all dirty and she's there for the Saturday night program. And she said to me, they told me that you couldn't finish it. But, you know, it's, it's all done. Anyway, so the program went on. She walked on stage, everything was fine. I, I went, I disappeared and had a shower. And after the, the program, uh, she asked me, she called me up, you know, she, um, so I went to see her and she said to me, well, is it, is it, it was a bit cold in the hangar, you know, is it possible that we can maybe patch up a few of the holes, this sort of thing? <laughs> uh, so I said, yes, you know, we a, so we bought some, some uh, tarps and placed them over for the, so the, the next morning we were up again trying to stop the, the weather. And the, and the puja went ahead and, and obviously uh, two years after that we shifted the hangar because we only had a temporary permit. So we moved it to the place that it is now. And uh, so throughout that, it just happened in four weeks now. There was people working on that place and we were working nearly 24 hours a day. We had fires burning at night and people, there was, there was so jogies. I remember one evening when we were pouring concrete at the end of the because we could only pour concrete between, because it was the weekend, the trucks had to be off the road at, you know, five o'clock in the morning, Saturday morning or whatever, or Saturday night, I can't remember when. But there was a period where there weren't any, allowed to be any trucks on the road over the weekend, Sunday or Saturday. So we had to pour all night to get it to, to ready. And, and I, I still remember that there was, there was one Sajogi there. I'm not really sure what his skills were, but uh, it wasn't in the building. But he was a great storyteller and had, had the, the greatest jokes. And his job was to keep the fire alive and tell jokes. And it was such, uh, there, was, there was work happening, concrete being poured, and I don't, there's, there's, no, there's no great pleasure in pouring concrete at one or two o'clock in the morning. But he made it a, a rather pleasurable experience. And there was, there was more people out there then uh, and it just seemed to occur it, the concrete you look around it just got poured how I'm not really sure but but definitely the the experience in terms of the interaction between Sajogis and the joy that was experienced by amongst the people there even today um, going back to Kabbala people remember the, the, you know, we were poor on concrete at you know, two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> not, not really something to be 
necessarily proud of, but they, they because of, of the, the, the fun that they had, that was, you know, it's, it was. So, and the, similarly when um, I went to Kanajahari, um, again we arrived there and the hangar or the building that arrived on a truck and it was a pretty muddy site and uh, literally nobody knew what was happening, what was supposed to happen. We got a, a truck and we got a set of drawings and I thought, okay, they we're off, you know. And ag again, there was people from all over the world um, and uh, without, without experience, some of them had never ever thought even thought about building you know so it's not as if you know that it was a, a passion and yet uh, it was rather amazing to see them all pull together and and again the play with Kana Jahari wasn't going to get finished wasn't going to get finished it got finished to a, to a point and and in my role, what I noticed was was purely and solely to start these projects. I never got to finish them, and even that is as um, as a builder and an architect is a rather difficult thing to cope with. And it was it was probably it uh, it was definitely went against the grain of my conditionings because I never ever got to finish any of them. Other people finished them, uh, and whether they ever got finished, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even sure. When I, when I go to, back to Cabela, I see things there that are, are, are probably not, not even now finished, but I don't think that was ever the purpose. So there was other people that did, did certain things throughout this, the life of this project and continued doing it. So, so I only had a a very small role in, in, in the project. But I suppose there's only one story which has is, which is happened to me just recently. So this is, you know, 10 years after the fact, uh, really. And it was, I was at, um, I was in Italy at Isola de Elba, a rather uh, pretty island off the coast of Italy. And I was there with a group of Sarjogis because we'd gone there to do a, a seminar on the island. Um, and the, the Sarjogis, the, there was a group of Sarjogis on this island. And so they, they had a weekend there and we were doing programs, music programs in the, in the town square on Saturday evening. Uh, bands, the St. Jacob bands playing, realisations being given, while people were having their meals with all these restaurants around this square, town square, which was a rather, uh, just that in itself was a rather uh, eye-opener for me because, you know, we've, we've had programs in halls this and that, but we, here we were sitting in the middle of a town square where the perimeter of the square was all bars and, and restaurants and it was the, the peak season, tourist season, so they were all full and and basically looking out over this stage where Sarjogis were uh, singing bhajans, singing songs, giving realisation, uh, Sarjoga talks and so on. Anyway, the interesting part was that what Sunday morning we were down at the river or the ocean, foot soaking, and uh, there was a group of us there that were had come from various parts of Italy, um, and one of the fellows there was was that was sitting next to me, who was the organizer of of this weekend in in uh, in Elba, and. He started uh, sort of rem reminiscing about his time in Kanajahari and that there was, um, 
yeah, the great, you know, he had a great time, and there was this Australian architect that was that he worked with, and uh, anyway, his he was basically saying it's such a great time, and obviously Rosario, who who was sitting on the other side, this fellow was sort of saying, well, the bloke you're talking about is sitting next to you, and. Interestingly enough, he it didn't he he didn't it didn't register it didn't register that he was actually talking about me, and he's going on to these. There was a few newish people there, you know, that had been uh, only in Santiago a couple of you know a couple of months or weeks or something, and he was saying, "Oh, you know, we had this great time," and then it clicked that. I can't remember how long, but you know, it must have been, you know, at least five to ten years that we hadn't seen. It. We only we we had met in Kanajari for a week or two weeks. He was there, and uh, and that was it. I'd never seen him ever since that time. And then all of a sudden, after this rather lengthy period of time, there we were sitting together with our feet in this ocean, and he. It was like yesterday that he, w the way he was explaining this this adventure he had, and this joy that he had, not even realizing that he, you know, and he was asking, he was like telling me the story, like as if I hadn't been there, you know, like, and it was so fascinating. And then when it hit him that it was me, it was finally they they said, hey. You know the blokes. You're talking about the blokes sitting next to you. you know? There was this uh, um, I, I, uh, this joy that that like we had never we had never uh, never been apart. It was like it had just been this continuous connection there. And so I think I've had that experience a few times with people that I work with in in either uh, Kabbalah or Kanajahari or in this case or, or uh, even shooty camps where people come up to you and say oh well you remember the time that you know we were doing this and I'm thinking hold on no <laughs> it, it takes a while to you know but it, it's there is definitely this connection there and I think that really um, I can only say that what what my, in terms of in retrospect it hadn't like I said when I started this it never it had nothing to do with the building of it we weren't we weren't building uh, and I, I can remember one one day at, at uh, shooty camps and Sri Maharaj asked me we were looking looking through some drawings that what she wanted to do and uh, I mean she was putting down some drawings on, on a piece of paper and she said to me you know that I'm a bit of an architect you know to, you know um, basically I build people that you know architects only build dead things buildings are dead you know it's people that are are the important part in none of the projects um, there was there was things happening, drama. There, there, there was always there was always a problem to resolve, either the material we couldn't get. I mean, even Cabela, we we went, we were trying to buy the sheets for the uh, to cover it, um, and that that was that was a drama. The in in shooty camps at the time, there was a. Uh, uh, there was someone in Sarajogo whose mother was upset because she felt that her daughter had got involved in a cult or something like this. And, I don't know, the media had got uh, some whiff of Sri Mataji buying this house in shooting camps. So one day they rolled up, the media rolled up there when I was there and they, they asked, her, you know, who's in charge and this and that and, you know, like, you know, I mean... I never felt part of that, the, the, the mire that was running around, but it was occurring right around you, and it was like you were in the eye of the cyclone. You know, if you stepped too, 
two steps forward, you get blown away. But you never ever wanted to put two steps forward. So that it was, it was, it's not all of it, just all of this drama that used to occur around you. And yet, um, under normal circumstances, if I look back, you know, I build every day and there always is problems, there's always dramas, there's always something to try and resolve and it gets, it gets tiresome. Whereas when we worked together and Sri Mataji was there sometimes and sometimes she wasn't. The majority of times she wasn't there, but definitely when, when the group of Sajogis were there working together, there's no question she was there. I mean, everybody sort of, if you asked anyone, they, they would have said, yeah, yeah, no worries, you know, even if physically she wasn't there. So, the, the um, and I think it is that part of, um, that part of her being the architect of people rather than buildings that was, was definitely the reality. And probably, just to finish off, I think one of the probably most important things that I can recall with my, of the, the short time I spent with Shimaji regarding buildings was, was at Shooty Camps, which was pretty early in the piece. And like I said, we were working long hours because we had this, you know, she'd put these timelines, oh, I'm coming up on the weekend, so you've got to get my room ready. And I thought, the, 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 this whole site was a bomb site. There wasn't even floors in the people. We had had ripped up the floorboards. And I remember that obviously we used to get up for meditation every morning at four o'clock in the good old days. And uh, at Shooty Camps, it was freezing cold. And so we'd get into this little meditation room, which was probably one of the only rooms with no heating. And 90% of the times, I think most of us were asleep rather than meditating. And it was fascinating because one day, we, and I'm not really sure how the conversation got to this, but she says to me, you know that, you know, foot soaking and all, all the other practices of Jagger, they, they're good and you should do them, but they're for you. Right? But if you don't meditate, then I can't do anything. And so to, for me, that is always stuck in my mind that, and you know, it, it, it was like, whoa, you know. But the reality of it is, is that when we were all together working away uh, on these projects, I would say that 90% of, them, of the people there were in meditation. She was able to do something. Because I tell you, otherwise, my experiences would be that we would have had more accidents than, than uh, we could have coped with. Because of that. <laughs> the amount of people that, uh, one night at Cabela, it was, it was very early in the morning, and we were belting steel with a, with a little sledgehammer, and all of a sudden I heard a thud. And I thought, oh no. And a fellow had hit his thumb, and it was so cold he had leather gloves on, but he th hit his thumb with his sledgehammer. So the sound of metal, bing, 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 and all of a sudden thud. And I thought, oh no, this bloke is gonna have a very flat thumb. So I, w I was debating whether to take his glove off or not, you know, in case. <laughs> the majority of the finger came with I took his glove off and literally there was a little red line around where his nail was and his thumb and yes it was rather red and turned rather black but it was all in one piece and literally I looked at it and I thought it's not possible there is no way someone can hit themselves with a sledgehammer against a 10 mil plate of steel and not have a flat finger thumb. So, like I said, there, there was 
things working there that were beyond uh, anybody's human control, for sure. Uh, and I, I, nobody ever thought, I don't think it ever crossed anybody's not, uh, mind that, you know, there could be accidents and so on and so forth. Whereas, if I walked on a building site uh, of that nature, like Cabela, or any of these building sites, as a professional builder, I'd be horrified. I would, I would actually tell them all to stop work and go home because before someone killed themselves. But nothing ever happened. I, obviously, every now and again, there used to be a, a small accident, which was insignificant in comparison to the risk. Because you've got to remember, some of these buildings, some of the stuff that we actually did is, was extremely high risk. You know? um, to the point where in Cabela, we lifted this, uh, this hangar with a, with a rather large crane and to the point where the, the crane, the, the, the owner of the crane company came to see this thing happening and virtually I had to tell him that he had to get off site because he, he wanted to stop the works because he thought it wasn't possible. What we wanted to do was not possible. And this was the owner of the crane company, and uh, and uh, so so I actually had to say, listen, you know, all due respects, but you have to get off site and stay away. You're not allowed, because he was trying to instruct his crane driver to do certain things. I says to him, mate, there's only one person instructing here, and that's not you. So, you know, uh, and the crane driver. The and that, that's a fascinating part. The, all of the workers that weren't Sarjogis, that worked on the sites, all had a great time. And all of them said to me, oh, Frank, you know, can, can uh, you got other projects? We want to, you know, we want to, you know, we had a, you know, this was great, you know. Like, and, and really, <laughs> it was no different. It was probably worse than what they experienced on a normal day-to-day -day basis. But, but they all were keen to keep, coming and to the point where the crane driver because I told him look in a couple of years we might have he says can you tell my boss now that I, I want to be on the next project that you lift it's got to be he says oh, all right but not that the boss was but yeah so so even the non sajogis were had experiences far beyond what they would were uh, ever expecting I think from uh, uh, from the projects and I think that's uh, about it. Uh, not not less necessarily an accident but one of them is like when we did Gijigana and we realised that we couldn't put the foundation because we found rock, granite and, and uh, so it just happened that one of the uh, fellows a non sajogi that that had been involved in in, in Gijigana through Joan Robin. Uh, his girlfriend at the time had a license to use explosives, so she was a what they call a powder monkey. Anyway, so we said, oh, you know, like, can we get her to blow up these rocks? And so. You know, nobody, we, very little experience with explosives, so, you know, we, we, and nobody, I, I didn't even think of, you know, we'll just blow it up. And so she came up, all prepared, with all the equipment, on a, on a Saturday morning, I think it was, and she said to me, did you get permission? And I was thinking, permission? What for? We just blow a few rocks. She says, well, you know, you, you can't. You just can't go blowing, blowing things up. Um, so I says, oh. Well, she said, you know, you need to really, you need to go through a process. You've got to fill in all paperwork. And so I said, oh, no. Well, you know. I said, look. So I made a phone call. And it was Saturday morning. 
I made a phone call to the mayor of the council, which I knew I had done work for him before. So I, so I didn't know him, right? So I ring him up. I says, oh, look, Carl, I says, uh, I've got a problem. You know, we're building this thing up in Gijigana, but, you know, we've found rock and now I, I, I want to, you know, blow it up. He says, oh, yeah, yeah, you've got to fill in this form and you've got to do this, this and that. So I says, oh, mm, Carl, but I've got a problem. He says, what's the problem? I says, well, the person to blow up the rock is here now. We want to do it now. He says, he says, okay, Frank, don't worry about it. Just do it. And if there's a complaint, I'll cover it. Right? He says, uh, if, there's no, if there's a complaint, right, come in Monday, I'll ring you up if there's a complaint. You come in Monday and sign the papers straight away before, you know, so that, and I'll backdate them and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll fix it for you. you. You do it. If there's no complaints, don't worry about it. If nobody complains, well, I'm worried about it. But you've, rec- I've, it's done. The paperwork's done. I'm thinking, phew, that was lucky. <laughs> so we proceeded to blow up the rock and a few other little things just for a bit of entertainment <laughs> on the day. But, but, and there was no complaints. I never heard, because about a week later, for some reason, I, I spoke to him again. He says, oh, how'd you go? Did you, did you get uh, done what you had to do? I says, yeah, yeah. He says, no, no, no complaints. So everything. So uh, a number of times there were these, these issues that popped up that, uh, you know, there were, you know, happened. Like, for instance, I, um, we went to... Uh, I went to the council in, in uh, Cambridge because of shooting camps and we, we didn't have permission to do anything. We hadn't done any plans. She might have done a few sketches. and we, because, But anyway, she wanted a hole busted in a wall, which was a major structural wall. So, you know, I thought, hmm, I better go to the council and find out what what's the rules of the land here and what. So we went to the council and said to them, "Look, we want to do this." And of course, they gave us all the forms, and you got to do this and you got to do that. So I said to the fellow, "I said, look, I don't have much time. You know, I need to bust this hole." And and it, you know, the fellow said to me, "What else are you doing?" Well, ultimately, we want to do this, 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 and this. And he says to me, out of the blue, I've never had this happen to me again before. He said to me, look, just do what you have to do in terms of this hole, bust the hole. He says, uh, but before you do all the other work, just put the drawings in and get the engineer to approve it because it's a major structural uh, and uh, And tell him, to give, let me know when they submit the drawings and give them to me. And I said to him, so he says, yeah, we'll do the paperwork later, don't worry about it. I, I don't know anything, basically, he says to me. <laughs> you know, like, okay, so it, it, it has happened uh, over and over again. Uh, I mean, we, we, we bogged concrete truck which nearly tipped over when we were pulling concrete late at night and uh, and I thought and we had to get this truck out before a certain time because he had to be off the road because of the curfew and we literally it was full of concrete the agitator was turning and all the wheels on one side had sunk because the, 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 the ground was wet and muddy and he slipped off the boards that we had to put. And it sunk. So we've got a concrete truck full of concrete, you know, I don't know, 
so eight cubic meters of concrete, seven cubic, you know, and uh, we didn't want to pour it on the ground because you know it costs money. <laughs> and, and anyway, so um, at at some ungodly hour, I rang sheepishly the excavator driver that had helped me with the uh, telecommunications pole. And I said to him, look, we got a truck bogged and, and uh, it doesn't look good. And this fellow, I'm sure, was asleep. Because it was about 1.30 in the morning. And he says to me, I'll be there. He comes and literally dug this truck out. We actually had to sink him on the other side and then he virtually pulled him out. Um, and we emptied him with five minutes to go. So because it would take him, it would take him 15 minutes to get back to the concrete plant. And it, and we before and there was about 20 minutes before the curfew came in. So the truck was out on the road, emptied, and he took off, and he would have got back to the plant only probably about five minutes before he would have to be off the road. Uh, so many things happened like that. Um, you know, people fell down holes and uh, we thought, oh no, broken leg or something. And <laughs> slowly you, you see this fellow crawling out, you know. So, I mean, obviously the hammer one was, was an obvious one because the sound, I can still remember the sound in my ears like that. But there were many times where things happened and they just got resolved or nothing happened, um, you know. I mean, even in Gijingana, we were carrying sheets, uh, rather long metal sheets, and, you know, how not someone didn't slice a leg or something is pretty amazing because they got close. I mean, even, I think Anil got, got pretty close to opening his leg up, but it never, never really got that, <laughs> that far, thank goodness. Direction, because obviously the, the majority of buildings that I were involved in were at the initial stages where there was a puja three weeks or four weeks away. You know, so that, that was the, you know, some of them were even two weeks. But we had, we had a vacant piece of land with, you know, and all of a sudden a pile of materials on one side and three weeks to put it up before the puja started. So most of them, the dramas were by remote control usually related to other people uh, say, oh, I should imagine it's not going to be ready so we should get we should we should uh, have plan B and and of course then then I'd I suppose in rest I'd be dragged into the mire but but uh, really I never had time to participate in it so to speak because they'd come to me and say well Shumanji wants to know whether it's going to be ready and I I just say, mate, like, if she wants it ready, it'll be ready. <laughs> How ready? I'm not sure, but it'll be ready. So it, it was that because for, for me, the attention was more on trying to get it finished. So, so but there was, there, there was an enormous amount of mire spinning around the periphery because even with uh, shooty camps, and in shooty camps... Um, because the building was already there and we were just doing you know, so-called renovations, Sri Mataji was playing another game there. She, uh, well, the first puja we had at Gijigana, um it was the, the hangar was up, no walls, and even the ridge cap, there was no ridge cap, but it was, was February or March, I can't remember, that. it might have even been January. So, summer, not no rain of course it did rain and you know the wind you know, as usual there, there was a sort of torrential rain sort of thing um and she she did make a comment she did say to me the steel because there were steel beams um 
which were there to take the next floor. Um, she said, they're not good. Um, you know, it'd be better to, to sort of uh, have timber. So that's why they ended up being covered. Uh, it was, it was, so she did make sort of comments like that. Not necessarily... No, no. And I've, I've never been... Because that's happened to people. I know. Well, in the early days when I was in Cambridge, I also went to Brompton Square, where I know that she used to walk down the passage and you'd be painting a wall and she'd uh, say, oh, I know, I don't like that colour. And then all of a sudden they have to paint it a different colour. My involvement, like I said, my involvement was pretty virtually at the beginning, you know, and, and one of the things I had to deal with is not finishing it. And that's, that's not, that wasn't an easy thing to cope with, for, mainly because of my training, you know. And you're, you're, doing, you're doing this thing and all of a sudden you've got to hand it over to someone else to finish. The, the, I had to go some, I had work, I had other commitments. So the, the, my timing, and, and, but it was fascinating because, you know, Sri Mataji would, you know, I, you know, she even took me to the airport once, you know, well, I mean, there was, you know, I went with her to, um, from Shooty Camps, she went down to London with her and then she took me to the airport because I had to fly out of thing. So I, w I had other commitments, obviously, also, um, but, but, um, it, yeah, the, 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 the converse, the, and the project was related to, let's say, the first puja. You know, so we build the hangar, we have the puja. And, and then it was like, you know, someone else takes after, after that. Um, the, you know, I mean, I've gone back and I've done work on Cabela over the years and we've done bits and pieces and so on and so forth. Um, and... There's, there's still an involvement there, even in other projects in Cabela. Um, so, but yeah, that that it it seemed as if there was a specific role, really. When I look back, you know, uh, for what reason? Probably because there, there was a conditioning I had to get over, you know. I and mean, there, there was probably, but in terms of in terms of my interaction with Shrimanaji, it was it was slightly different to you know changing changing and changing. It was more we would have this you know even shooty camps we had discussions about she wanted uh, one floor for the children and how we're going to build the cubby houses and the type of dolls that we she would collect from all over the world for the kids to play and enjoy and and you know there was. A lot of it, the building was, was, was virtually, the building was there but was, was, wasn't necessarily, it was more what was going to happen, um, including, you know, we used to, you know, she would talk about the, the floor, even in the, in the hangar she said to me, we should, we should do an earth floor, you know, so we should compact the ground. And, so on and so forth. It's ended up with a concrete floor with heating underneath it. But that wasn't the discussions originally in, in the first. But obviously she would have had discussions with other people of, of a totally different age. So the, the change, you know, if if someone said to me, well, you know, what, what did she want did you, you know, want for a floor? Well, the discussions I had with her you know, was an earth floor. And in, in Kanajahari, we, we spread hay all over the place. And I get, I get hay fever, <laughs> so I don't think at all. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't that weekend, you know, so. But.